To understand why the ocean matters, think of the world as viewed by astronauts first. You know, there it is, the planet as viewed from out there in the sky. Well, the world is basically blue. You can turn it so that all you see is ocean. That would be the Pacific Ocean, the blue face of the planet. But you keep turning and you see that no matter how you turn it, which way, whatever, it's still largely blue. Land occupies, you know, about a third of the surface scattered around, but all land, whether it's the continent of the United States with a little connection down to, you know, South America, North America, South America, a little connection in between. It's, we're all islands in blue. And as a kid, I could see this on a, a globe that was sort of static, and land here, ocean there. But now, human eyes have been up in space looking back. We have photographs, we have images. And now we also have the capacity to dive into the ocean and see what's under the surface. Google Earth didn't exist when I was a kid. Now it does. Uh, we now can open up National Geographic maps and see the configuration of the sea floor, see mountains that we didn't even know of their existence when I was a kid. Most of the mountains on Earth have never been seen by anyone, let alone climbed. And never mind, you have to start at the top underwater and climb down on the land, you start at the bottom and climb up, of course, but now we know. Now we know these physical things, but I think the most important thing that we now know is that our lives depend on the existence of the ocean, that it's where most of Earth's water is. 97% of Earth's water is ocean. All life requires water. No water, no life. It's, that's pretty basic. So every human on Earth depends on the ocean. Every one of us is a sea creature in a way because we need the ocean every much, bit as much as a, a grouper or a shark or a coral reef. We need the ocean. No ocean, no us. That's pretty basic. Take away the ocean, you've got a planet a lot like Mars. No atmosphere with oxygen, the atmosphere of Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. It took a very long time for Earth, even with an ocean, even with a water, for life to transform rocks, water, and <laughs> whatever existed here to a place with mostly a carbon dioxide atmosphere into something where we have 20% oxygen that is just right for humans and the rest of life on Earth as we know it. So we should thank plants Thank trees, thank grass, thank ferns, and thank particularly phytoplankton in the ocean that generates more than half of the oxygen we breathe and captures much of the carbon, drives the great ocean food webs, makes life on Earth possible. It's the ocean. If you want to say, well, why should we care about the ocean? It's because it keeps us alive, stupid. <laughs> If you're lucky enough to live in a place like Sanibel Island, or even visit there for heaven's sakes, it's such a gift because you see the interface between the land and the ocean. Uh, I used to look out on the Gulf of Mexico as a kid. That's what you do when you're at Sanibel. You look out on this great blue and imagine what was beneath the surface and imagine being on the surface even and traveling over to see what was on the other side. Where would I finally reach another piece of land? You have to go a pretty long way to, from Sanibel to get to Mexico, but you can imagine that hummingbirds fly across the surface of the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of fish swim the length of it. Sharks, whale sharks, and even grouper can swim a long distance, although they always come back home, the groupers do. They have places they live, like people have home bases, so do many of the fish. And so having access to the sea is, is a real gift. Not every kid on the planet has such an opportunity. 
I wish that every kid could see what those who come to Sanibel and are exposed to the, that view, that experience. I think a good recipe for changing the world is to make sure that no child is left dry. You know, got to get people out there and get them wet to see the world, to feel the ocean. And if you can, as a child who's had that experience, then share the view, at least vicariously, by telling people what it's like and getting them to see if they can make it happen for themselves. If not at Sanibel, maybe in the Mediterranean, maybe on the African coast, maybe, uh, maybe in California. There are kids who live right next to the sea who don't do what the kids in Sanibel are encouraged to do, which is to go out, and get wet, to see the ocean up close and personal. What was transformative for me as a child living on the Gulf Coast, Dunedin, Florida, was access to the ocean and to life in the sea. That I could see it isn't just rocks and water. There's great joy just in a liberating feeling of being weightless in the ocean. But what, what really captured my heart and has held my attention ever since I was a child was getting acquainted with the life in the sea. Most of life on Earth lives in the sea. The greatest diversity is definitely there. The, all the major divisions of animal life are out there in the sea. Only about half of them occur on all of the land put together. Even the richest rainforest doesn't have the great diversity of animal life in terms of the big wedges of animal life that you can find in an area you can embrace with your arms in a seagrass meadow in the Gulf of Mexico. You can find these divisions of animal life. You can find jellies. You can find sponges. You can find crustaceans, vertebrates. You can see digging down into the, into the mud, the sand, you can find not just relatives of earthworms, polychaete worms, but you can find gorgeous little ribbon-like worms. And you can find some that are flatworms and roundworms. And there are some that are swimming along in the ocean called arrow worms, ketognaths. I mean, just now I've, I've named perhaps a dozen or maybe 10 phyla of animals, these big groups of animals. It's a big part of the diversity of life on land. There, there are lots that don't occur on land at all, you know? But you can find them out in your aquatic backyard. But that, to me, is just overwhelmingly wonderful and endlessly fascinating. You don't know what you're going to find when you look under the surface of the ocean. Whatever it is, you know it's going to be good. We have the, we have the power of knowing. With knowing, there's a pretty good chance you're going to care about what you know. You can't care if you don't know. You might not care even if you do, but knowledge is the key. Now we know that the ocean keeps us alive. Now we know. There's this great diversity of magical creatures in the ocean. Our actions will determine their future. We're polluting the ocean through what we're putting in. We're dismembering, just taking apart the ocean by what we're taking out. The fish, the crabs, the oysters, the lobsters that we're just taking, taking, taking. And the, the ocean is simply not able to rebound from the, the magnitude of what we're extracting. We're just taking too much too fast and disrupting the way the ocean functions, even changing the chemistry of the ocean by what we're extracting from the sea and what we're putting into the ocean. So every one of us who knows the importance of the sea, who cares about the importance of the sea, we have, I mean, it's a, an obligation, it's a responsibility, but it's a joyful responsibility. We can make a difference. We can stop the harm. We can make peace with the ocean. We can be the leaders. We must be in terms of changing the way people think about the ocean, that it's not just a place to dump things, not just a place to extract whatever we want to take from the ocean, whether it's minerals or oil or gas or, or creatures that we, we think of as beautiful, like 
shells. I mean, it's okay to take dead ones, perhaps, but you know, we've we've just stripped many places by the large number of live animals we've taken, and certainly the fish are really depleted. And we've done a, a great job of depleting whales. It took us a couple hundred years to take them from where they were to down to a fraction of what these big animals. We're relatively small animals compared to whales. We have the power of arming technology to kill. And we've killed a lot of whales, a fraction of the numbers that were there 200 years ago. And we've done it now with fish, largely in the last 50 years, because we've armed ourselves with technologies to find, capture, take to market, and not just near where they're extracted, but market all over the world. Fish taken from the Gulf of Mexico winds up in New York City and halfway around the world. And we import fish from halfway around the other side of the world. Maybe we should just consider stop eating wildlife, period. Give them a break. Who needs to eat a grouper anyway? Well, maybe another fish <laughs> eat, see, eat some grouper, because that's what fish do. But we don't have to do that. We have plenty of choices. Maybe we can choose to leave the fish in peace and see what happens. The ocean will be stronger, healthier, better, better for us too. As a child, I was blessed first, my first 12 years in New Jersey, living on a small farm, connected to the birds, the frogs, a little pond in our backyard, the trees. We had a big garden. I knew where food came from. I knew the importance of rain. I just learned it naturally. I think even at, a, at an early age, I became conscious of what is known as ecology, how systems work and how we're a part of it, not apart from it. I think farmers who live close to the land or anyone who has access, that even in New York City, there's a wonderful concept that somebody started years ago of keeping intact a place that we call Central Park. I've been diving in Central Park in the summer, looking for creatures who live there, and I found a few. Mosquito larvae, <laughs> a big snapping turtle. Um, we found not the kind of diversity that existed maybe in a natural pond 50 or 100 or 1,000 years ago, but there was life there. Even in New York City, it is one of the most urbanized parts of the planet, a lot more cement than open ground. But even there, hawks nest, and you have a chance to fly with them if you just let your spirit soar along with them, or to see the birds. Where did, I mean, as a kid, kids naturally ask questions. They ask who, what, why, where, when, how. It doesn't matter where they arrive on the earth, whether it's out in a desert environment, in a rainforest, in Dunedin, Florida, New York City, or London, wherever. They start out as curious creatures. And the lucky ones never lose that curiosity. Many of those lucky ones become scientists, explorers, or really inquisitive human beings. They can be anything. They can be bankers or teachers or airline pilots or doctors, they, just keeping that inquisitiveness. The questions, who am I? Where did I come from? Where, where am I going? What's the future going to be like? How, where'd that bird come from? How does that bird fly? You look down at the cracks in the sidewalk and you see green stuff, little moss and even flowers growing in a sea of cement. There's life that's prospering. And a smart kid will respond and, and ask those key questions that kids ask everywhere. What is this? How does it live? Where did I come, where do I fit in? How are we related? It's one of the joys of being a human being. And it's the best hope for the future of humankind. Kids who ask questions and never stop. All right, and that it's all like this. Can't save people without saving the ocean. <laughs> and it takes people now, it's our turn to do what we can to save the ocean.
If I were to be reborn as a sea creature, I would choose to be born me because I'm a sea creature too. I need the ocean, fish need the ocean, but no ocean, no me. Uh, <laughs> it isn't just that I love to swim and I, you know, but, and it's not just that, even though I don't have fins or gills, I need the ocean. All of us need the ocean. I think every, every earth creature is a sea creature. We have to be and think of ourselves that way because the ocean is the heart of what makes our existence possible.